Hi hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Cybeers. Uh, this time around, I've managed to rope in our level three digital forensics and incident responder, uh, Richard Granger. He's been with us for about, what, a month now, Rich? A bit more? Yep, yeah, yep. I think this is uh, end of week four today. End of week four, there you go, how time flies. So yep. uh, we thought today we'd get into it. There's always one in the crowd who doesn't drink beer. Um, so Rich is going to get in and uh, review a good gin that he's got. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to have a look at this one that I got today. It's a uh, Ballistics Beer Company Mexican Hot Chocolate Stout. Uh, oh. It's 13 degrees in Melbourne today. So uh, perfect. It's, uh, it's <laughs> worthwhile. It's from Salisbury. In Queensland, of all places, who would have thought that Queenslanders would do a uh, a dark stout? But we'll we'll find out yep. what it's like. So, what are you what are you on today, Rich? Uh, today I've got uh, the Little On Distilleries Miss Yoko Gin. Where is that from? So Little On is a distillery in the CBD of Melbourne. It's yeah, hidden, right. hidden away a little little cottage. I think it's like. One of the few heritage buildings that's still a single story one that's still standing there. <laughs> Cobblestone out the front and everything goes yeah. along with it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Look, Melbourne's starting to lose a few of those and lose its character and its charm. Um, but hopefully, once all this lockdown nonsense finishes, we can uh, we can all get back into the CBD and, and get down yep. to what was it, little Yoko? Little little on. So the the little gins the Miss Yoko. Miss so Yoko. Fresh seasonal lye cheese. Well, I've got to admit, this Ballistics Beer Co. Uh, Mexican hot chocolate stout. If you're into your stouts and you like a little bit of chili and some kick, it goes down well. <laughs> so anyway, we thought we'd talk about some some instant response today. What to do if you do get compromised, but then start to get to talk about cyber insurance because we've done a little bit before about ransomware. Uh, we've done some things before around how to to respond to a ransomware breach. But we never really got talking previously about cyber insurance and JBS mates uh, the last couple of weeks and paying, how much was it? Was it 14 million in the end that they paid for? Was, for the I think it was a, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, Colonial getting compromised by a threat actor group and they paid 11 million US. Um, and it just happened. It just seems that the, the ransoms keep going up. Organizations keep getting compromised. And I want to know, Rich, why? <laughs> why, why does this keep on happening? Is it is it still the same basic hygiene issues? Um, I haven't sort of looked into the specifics of those. I mean, I'd be very interested to read any reports that come out, but I'm sure that they're all kind of under wraps. But, yeah, I mean, that sort of seems to be the general consensus with these ones is it, it's sort of hygiene issues, um, patches out of date, um, not sort of implementing good security policies and it's just it, it's all the same stuff isn't it um yeah it, it threat actors can easily compromise a network they can easily easily launch some ransomware against an organization they can lock everything down and then all of a sudden the organization's got to pay a random amount of bitcoins to get access to the keys and i, I think it's happening more and more because it really is that easy um, it, it, it doesn't seem to be anything that's actually too difficult about doing this. Yep. Uh, one of the one of the ones that uh, that we've assisted some incident response with, it was really interesting. The the guy who or the threat actor uh, who actually compromised the network, he wasn't the one who wrote the malware. And when he uh, when he needed to get the decryption keys, he needed to go and talk to the author of the malware to get the decryption keys and. What it tra transpired is that the author and the actual uh, person who did the compromising the threat actor, they shared the ransom 60-40. So the, the author got 60% of the ransom and the, the threat actor got 40%. So it, it's this malware for hire that we keep on hearing about that we're actually seeing come true. Yeah, ransomware is a service. Yep, and look, we, we see it all the time, these organisations be compromised. What, what should an organisation do? Um, they they come in at 10 o'clock in the morning, they're, they're working away and all of a sudden everything gets gets ransomware or they suffer an incident. What what should they be doing? From, well, from a IR perspective, I guess one of the important things is to not really panic. Um, obviously, you know, something bad's happened. It's, it's going to impact you um, 
potentially devastating for the company. But I think, yeah, it's sort of important to, to keep a level head. If you've got an instant response plan, kick that in. If you've got a... Uh, Follow uh, the IR plan. Who, yeah. who, who would have thought? If you've got a you know an instant response company on retainer, you engage them, or hopefully you do have one on retainer. If not, start reaching out and trying to get that in place. Get one right. Um, make sure that you've got those pre agreed terms and and payment with the IR company, so you can you can call them first thing and they drop everything to respond. If you're not on a retainer. You have to work with that IR company to get through terms and conditions. You have to agree um, rates. Legal has to review it. It can take a full day um, to, to get through all that if you don't have their retainer in place. So everyone always says, why, why do I need a retainer? It's so that uh, the, the the IR team can get working immediately. CrowdStrike's done research and found that the Chinese threat actor group, I think it was, they can smash and grab, and I'll, I'll put the, the link to the research up uh, in the video, but I think it was 18 minutes or under 18 minutes they can they can smash and grab. So if they target you and they want to get it in and want to get the data out, it'll take them less than 18 minutes. So if you're not following the, the 11060 rule, one minute to detect, 10 minutes to triage, 60 minutes to respond, you're already behind the game. And if it's taking you a full day to, to go through terms and conditions and agree rates with your IR company, the threat's are already gone. They've already taken all the data and they're out the door. Yep. Yeah, I think it it's important to have that stuff in place. Uh, you don't really want to be scrambling. There's a lot going on when you got an incident like that, and having stuff in place is a, just a peace of mind, and you know what to do. And it's probably part of the IR policy is that you know if you, you think you've been attacked with ransomware, um, step one is to call the people that will be able to jump in and start investigating. Yeah, look, and it, it's not even just ransomware. I'm I'm all dressed up with nowhere to go on a on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> However, the the reason for to the the shirt is we were on site myself and uh, Manish, the stealth team lead, were on site doing a, a physical engagement today. So we were very successful in in planting a device uh, within the client network. We've now got Open VPN uh, and remote SSH into so. We can now launch all kinds of attacks and it's gone undetected. It, it will now sit there and we'll do some interesting things over the weekend. So we talk a lot about ransomware, but there's so many different events and, and threats that are going on that you could have to respond to um, during an incident. It could be a targeted advanced persistent threat group that have decided, I want to go after Richard Granger. I'm, I'm going to get in no matter what. And they spend years doing this until they finally achieve their mission and, and the target, which is to, to compromise that organization. Yeah, um, and a lot of you know these these actor groups are that's that's their business. You know, they do their nine to five, mm. and they've got the resources behind them to you know cover that. I I always like watching the the graph, and I think I've mentioned this on a previous side is of watching during Chinese New Year, and you can actually see where the the common threats are coming from, and we can actually you know say this now with, with definitive knowledge because of the. The information that was released from the NSA last year, and you can you watch the attacks they they come across, and then during Chinese New Year it actually drops and it goes again, and then it picks back up all the traffic uh, in and out and all the the threat research and the threat maps. So it, it is a business, um, yep. and they're they're making a lot of money off of it. They're not going to stop. Um, they're just going to keep doing it because they're making millions of dollars. It's very very profitable. Yeah. There was one, I think one of the one of the big threat actor groups was actually, um, what they do, they shut down. It was the big one that compromised Colonial, actually, the reason they went after the, the big fish. They shut down straight away. But what I find really fascinating is that $4.4 million US dollars of the ransom in cryptocurrency has been recovered. I, I, I don't understand. Isn't it, uh, isn't it meant to be an untrackable and unverified and you, you can't actually well, compromise well, the currency? I, I mean, I, I've only very briefly dabbled in Bitcoin, but I, I understand there's like a ledger so that you can still track, mm. um, you know, where the transactions are going. And I'm sure that, you know, threat intel groups out there have sort of identified certain wallets that are belonging to threat mm. groups. Um, so you, you might be able to, to see it that way. Yeah, and I, I think that's it. That if you can, if you've got that one wallet, and the uh, 
the authorities can track that wallet. They they surely have a way that they can they can plant backdoors and, and ways and means. They're, they're not silly people. Look look at the uh, anom <laughs> the anom communications application that they yeah. utilised yeah. in a few months. Yeah, <laughs> that's a topic for a whole another day. That one that was a uh, that was great. That was I enjoyed that. Very interesting. Read that. Yeah, uh, if you're watching this video and you haven't come across the the anom um, application that was utilised for <laughs> encrypted end-to-end -end messaging uh, by Underworld Figures as yet, go and do some research. It, it's really interesting. Yeah, um, it's, I'm very um, curious as to getting a full understanding of how it was found out because I, I think it might have been just some sort of researchers that were just interested in, you know, looking at this particular app and how it was communicating and sort of identified that it might not just be going to where you think it's going. <laughs> I think the, the interesting part was that it was jointly developed by the Australian Federal Police and the, the FBI. Uh, the Australian Federal Police launched a number of raids uh, because they could intercept and see the data. Um, the US, the, the FBI, because of their privacy laws, <laughs> they're still yet to actually be able to get hold of the, the data and make any arrests. They, they actually partnered with Australia and the AFP because of our lax privacy laws compared to, to what they have in the US. Um, it blows my mind, the, the, yeah, the lack of privacy that we have. But maybe it's proving why it's worthwhile. Um, who knows? There's, there's a counter side to, to every argument. Mm. Um, the one thing I'm not looking forward to or am looking forward to because maybe it will change people's mind and I want to get your view on this is AXA, um, a very large insurance company. They've announced that as of the, the 1st of July this year and in France, they're not going to be paying ransoms uh, that are claimed on cyber insurance. So you get uh, you get ransomware like uh, like JBS or, or Colonial, you pay your $15 million in, in Bitcoin to, to get the decryption keys and you know, it's, you know, threat actors go and split that off evenly or not evenly, however they've structured it. And then you get your keys back. You, you now lo lodge the, the ransomware payment to your insurance company and Axe is the first one who's saying, no, we're not going to pay that. What, what's your view on that? It's interesting. I, I mean, I know that a lot of sort of threat actors and even, you know, when they've spoken in interviews with specific people, they've mentioned that they target um, companies that have that, insurance policy in place like they and have been known to actually hack into cyber insurance companies to find their client list really so that they that can one. yeah so they can basically go through and go all right well these are all the companies that are insured so we'll hack them wow. steal data or I'll encrypt their data and hold them ransom um because they know that they've got that that policy in place so i don't know whether it just means that you know through actors are just Maybe they'll just avoid companies that don't have, you know, the, the ability to pay through insurance or... Well, you think maybe, maybe they'll, just... they'll start compromising the insurance companies so they know maybe to target those organisations. Or do you actually think that organisations rely a little bit too much on cyber insurance because they, they see that as their insurance policy? And they say, well, if we get compromised, what well, you know, the Australian public's got... Uh, got um, breach fatigue at the moment as it is. So there's no reputational damage these days. We will claim it on our cyber insurance. Do, mm. do you think that maybe they'll actually start implementing good security um, processes or they'll, they'll continue to run the corner? I, I think they might have to. I mean, I am i haven't really you know had a lot, of, lot to do with cyber insurance, but it, I've always found it very interesting in terms of how they sort of baseline whether you should receive a policy or not, because let's yeah. say you're company A and, you know, you've been running vulnerability, you've got vulnerable software that's hanging out on the internet and it's been vulnerable for three years. You haven't right. patched your machines in in months. Surely there should be some kind of threshold where, you know, if you're not maintaining that strong security posture, maybe you shouldn't be eligible to get that, that payment or... Yeah. Or there's different scales of you know how much of a premium you're going to be paying depending on your your posture. So I, I find that 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 side of it's very interesting, and I'm be interested to know how that's all structured. Yeah, look, I I went to RSA in or oh, in San Fran. What year was it? Might have been 2017. 
um, with the with Os Cyber. It was the first time we were there, and they they took us out to meet this uh, really interesting company out in the valley named a uh, little little company called Upguard, who you, you might have come across if you if you're watching this and you haven't come across Upguard for, for third party risk management. Get, recommend uh, reaching out to them and, and having a look into it. But what transpired was that the insurance companies were actually utilizing Upguard when they were doing their policies to find out what their what their uh, cyber hygiene looked like to see, okay, should we be offering this this company a policy? Now, that was in the US in 2017. It, it, it's now 2021 in Australia. And I, I haven't seen any form of, of that be utilized. It's still the same thing. Hey, I, I want an insurance policy, a cyber insurance policy. You, you get the form from the insurer, you go through your ticket, do you do regular vulnerability scanning? Yes. Okay, well, that's well and good. What do you do with the vulnerabilities? Do you, do you patch have a it? <laughs> well, you'd yeah. think so. Um, a lot of organizations might go and stick a WAF in front and just ignore it and not patch it, but no, it's, you know, yep. it's not here or there. Um, we'll get onto WAFs one day as well and why they don't work, um, but <laughs> maybe I'll drag one of the offensive guys in. Um, but then they, they ask questions like, do you, do you have a sock? And they never go and ask for proof or they don't ask, is the, the sock nine to five daytime? Is it 24 seven? What level is it? it? They ask all these questions, but there's no, there's no meat to it. There's no follow up mm -hmm. in the back end. And I, I still think that comes back to why Australian organizations keep getting breached. They, they rely too much on insurance and they're not asked to validate anything to, to actually prove they've got something in place. Yep. Or when they're asked if they have an incident response plan, like you say, they've got an incident response plan, but an incident happens and, and they don't it, follow it. It hasn't been updated and tested. <laughs> oh, testing of incident response plans. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a new? Wouldn't that be a new thing to do? Uh, how many incident response plans get written and they just they sit on a shelf? They don't actually get brought out and tested. Mm. Um, they need to be getting their their providers like yourself, like TL involved to run the, through these as a as even a tabletop exercise. To ask the executive, what would you do um, in the event there was a compromise? I think there's even a I can't remember the name for I'll I'll put it maybe we'll put it in in the link. But um, is it like an actual board game that was developed around cyber incidents? So you know you've got all these different scenarios and you go through it and you play it and you know, roll dice and then, you know, A happens or B happens and sort of, you know, gamification of uh, the testing of that, the, the policy. Is that where cyber needs to go? Do, do we do we talk way too much jargon and, and technical things that we do need to start doing that for the general public to, to understand cyber, do you think? Potentially. I mean, it would be fun. <laughs> you know, I, th <laughs> I fun think it's, just... yeah, I you think it's sort of a, you know, a good way to expose maybe people that you know they're not they're not one hundred percent sure what cyber is, what everyone does, and what it all means. It's it might be a good way to get them involved. Look, the everyone, very few people outside of the industry um, understand the jargon and the language we throw around. We could be saying flux capacitator for for all they know. Um, but all of the terms and so the cyber industry is the worst at jargon acronyms and just calling things something fancy to make it sound like what we do is hard um, i'll be the first to put my hand up and say cyber is not hard what we do is not difficult um, it just takes a little bit of understanding yeah um do you think we're training enough people in in cyber there, there's another interesting one the the government raised a, a topic a few years ago to say we're going to have this cyber skill shortage um, maybe gamification and things like that are, are going to help to get people into the industry. Yeah, I think anything that sort of can, you know, entice people in is a good thing. And not just massive salaries, right? Because, yeah. you know, <laughs> everyone thinks you just come into the world of cyber and all of a sudden you're going to get paid this huge salary, not realising that we've all started on the bottom rung and we've all generally got a, a technical background to make sure that when an incident happens, we know where to look and, and what to look for and where the bad guys have been. I think that's one of the the best sort of sources for coming to cyber is, you know, you, you might be working in a, a different IT field, you know, service yeah. desk, networking, Wintel and stuff like that. And that sort of knowledge is very, very valuable and you're able to sort of transition that when you come across. Oh, absolutely. You know, 
you know where the dirty laundry is. Um, yep. As a as a person who sits on both the, the red and the blue team, um, and I get that fortunate perspective of seeing both, during a red team engagement, my favourite thing to do is to, to look in OneDrive, look in SharePoint for a service account. Service account is going to be a domain admin. It's not going to have multi-factor authentication. So I go and get my, uh, my prepaid phone out, register it with MFA, so now I control the MFA and I can move laterally through the network and the best SOC is not going to find me because I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. I'm mm. administering the network and I'm moving throughout where I should be. And I think it's these skills that a lot of offensive people are missing out on these days. They know how to run Responder. They, they know how to grab password hashes, but they, they don't know the basic places to look without being, uh, without being caught and how to evade uh, instant responders. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's sort of... Having you know dabbling in you know the red te- red team stuff and uh, hack the box and stuff like that, and I found it's having that perspective from the other side is invaluable. Yeah, and I know you're you're getting heavily involved in uh, the blue team security stuff at the moment. Um, yeah. If if you're watching this video um, and you haven't checked them out yet, check out Blue Team Labs online. Uh, been around for about six months now company that's launched out of the UK doing huge, awesome things for, for the blue team. Um, finally realising that uh, defensive is the best team. You know, defensive, yeah. <laughs> no offence, guys, but, you know, the defensive is, is a little bit more interesting. Um, yeah, so how, how, are you finding, how are you finding the blue team labs and how is that benefiting you? It's it's really good. I think um, one of the things that I, I, I've found with it is, I'm getting to sort of use some tools again that I haven't used for a while. So mm-hmm. it's really good at, you know, refreshing the usage of them. Um, well, I think I was, I was doing one last night and it was like network minor and like, I haven't touched network minor for, for ages. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. And so I got, got to play around with that for, for a little while. And I guess they, they're fun. They're, they some of them are very quite challenging. Um, but it's also gives you opportunity to think about things like holistically. And mm. I, I think one of the things that I've sort of fallen the trap of, and some of them is overthinking things and going down a rabbit hole for, you know, two days, trying to trying to find yeah. something, and then realizing it was right in front of me the whole time. So it's, it's good. That's fun. going to be the same in, in the real world during incident management though. It, it's not always going to be the, the most difficult thing. It, it could just be, a compromised host they've grabbed the hashes from they've cracked some password now passwords now all of a sudden they've got legitimate user accounts i mean not not every threat and this this comes back to our original topic not every threat is an apt it 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 is just going to be that bored kid who has a little bit of knowledge who's sitting there and decided he wants to attack your organization and if at the end of the day if they want to get access to your network they will get access making sure you got the right defensive controls in place to catch it and stop it before it turns huge. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've never asked you is what, what's your favorite incident that you've, uh, that you've ever investigated? Obviously not, uh, not naming names and, and keeping it as high level as possible, but I'm keen to hear a war story. Favorite incident. Hmm. I think one of, one of the most interesting ones uh, I've, worked on is um regarding you know just a a regular old phishing but they've actually managed to gain credentials internally yeah uh, initially and then sending more internal phishing so that's bypassing your if you don't have your email protection set up to look at internal mail um basically everything internal is going to go go through fine um interesting so they fished They fished users internally utilizing a fished account to bypass all the filters. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And also some some interesting things I learned along the way as well about, um, uh, I think it was, trying to remember the exact terminology, but I think it was like legacy authentication with certain Microsoft like Office and, and Outlook and stuff like that. And um if if that's allowed that can impact 2fa 
So if you have yeah. successfully credential, you got the credentials fished from other users and you um, modify how you're gaining logins to certain services, then you're able to get through with that 2FA. That's that's cool. Um, and this is why we, we need things like intelligence-led red teaming because if you you get pen testing done, right? As an organization, you, you have a pen test. That's time boxed and it's scoped against one web app or external network. Whereas if it's intelligence led red teaming, they're the kinds of things that the red team is going to try because otherwise you would never think about it. Mm. You, you wouldn't actually consider and go, okay, can we bypass MFA? Everyone trusts MFA. Everyone's faith is in MFA, but there are ways and means that you can actually bypass it such as that. Yep. Um, one, uh, no, I'm, I'm going to get absolutely hammered by uh, Manny Brecht and, and Jack on this because I cannot remember the the name of the uh, of the attack that they're, they're utilising at the moment. Um, and I'm not even going to try because they'll, they'll roast me even further. So <laughs> shout out to the the stealth crew. Um, I know you're watching this and you, you're going to you know have a go on me, but they're able to uh, intercept the session token at the moment and replay the session token to to bypass MFA. So it's not even about stealing the, the MFA token. It's actually grabbing the session ID. And a lot of services are vulnerable to this. I think that that so happened that, recently, if I'm not mistaken, with the EA hack. So that's the attacker uh, managed to get like cookie sessions or a session token from a Slack account that no the, way. the employee had. And I think that was sold for like, I might be wrong, but I think it was like 10 bucks or something like some small no, amount. And from that, no. they managed to get into the EA Slack environment and then basically social engineer the service desk to provide them access to what they needed to. And that's resulted in, you know, the FIFA source code, the their Frostbite engine source code. Yeah, with the whole there. engine. Yeah. The, the new Battlefield game that, that, uh, that you've been so excited about. That's what I'm really worried about is, you know, day one, jump on the Battlefield and there's already hackers everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to happen. And this brings me back to my my favorite ever topic that I I thought we I thought we'd done away with as an industry and as um, as organizations that take cyber seriously. We're not a bank, we don't need bank level security. And it it, it doesn't fly. It it shows EA, you know, EA compromised. JBS, that that literally they're a meat manufacturer. Yeah. <laughs> like I I it's pretty I far away from a bank. It is so far away from a bank. And threat actors are going to target your information and your systems no matter what. The, the, the access and the data that you hold is very valuable. The, um, the one that I find super interesting at the moment is they, uh, the threat actors will they'll ransomware the network if they're, if they're going after ransomware. APTs, you generally won't see ransomware um the, they want the access to the network and they want the data but we're we're talking about the majority of attacks not apts because that's a different world they'll they'll uh, ransom your systems and they'll say okay it's five million uh, in bitcoin if you don't pay us we've got all your data and we'll, we'll post it online um and we'll make it available for everyone and here's a countdown timer to, to tell you when that's going to happen so all organizations that used to rely on backups and they were saying, oh, we got backups, it's it's fine, we'll just go and restore. No, they're now compromising the network, moving laterally, stealing everything, then putting ransomware on there. They've they've gotten a lot smarter because they know everyone was just relying on backups and cyber insurance. Yeah. So even if you do restore your data, you know, they've got a copy of it and they're saying if you don't pay, we'll 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 post it, we'll sell it. Yeah. And we're gonna yeah, I mean, an interesting. I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this. Um, let's say you know, company A has been um, compromised. They've had ransomware mm -hmm. installed in their machines, and you know, they're they're, they're willing to pay the one million Bitcoin or one million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Should should companies uh, prepare for this by already creating Bitcoin wallets in preparation for? I, yeah. And I, I think they are. Um, we've been involved in some IR um, at, at the start of this year where the, the organization had no choice but to, to pay the ransom. And the, no, no, one had, uh, no one had Bitcoin. 
no yeah. one had a crypto wallet. So and, and taking it takes takes time to set up those wallets. You know, you've got to verify, you gotta give them yeah. your ID, you've got to set it all up, and then you gotta transfer the money to buy the Bitcoin yeah. and it takes time. Takes, takes five days. Um so yeah, look if I'm 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 coming at it from a different perspective. You should be putting decent controls in place first and you know your defense in depth and you should have a, a 24-7 onshore sock, you should do red teaming, you, you should do all of your insurance checks. But as we said previously, if a threat actor wants to get access, they will. So being prepared for that rainy day, does it hurt to have? Well, no. So that's actually a really good recommendation to come from come from this. Um, is possibly to to look at the viability of setting up a Bitcoin wallet. It's actually something I'd never considered before. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, maybe even to, if it's just sitting there ready to go. I mean, Bitcoin could be fairly volatile, so maybe not uh, yeah, don't dump, dump, dump money in it and then sort of watch it as you know whether Elon Musk goes on SNL and not <laughs> see, it, see it go up and down. Oh, but wow. yeah, I mean, if the, if the wallet's created and ready to go. It's probably not going to hurt. Yeah, you can transfer into it pretty quickly and, and get access back, uh, which that's the that's the main driver for most organisations is how do we get the business back online as quick as possible? Um, when, you, when you think about it, most businesses in Australia are transaction-based businesses. They, they do a very small transaction and they get paid for it, right? So... Even if you take systems offline for a couple of weeks, there's not many organisations that are going to be able to survive um, because you you know you look at most of retail, you look at cafes, restaurants, you look at all of these kinds of businesses, and they need to get systems back online to take those couple of cents every time. So time to respond is absolutely key. Yep. And so, one thing that sort of I, I think I was watching a. Sands did like a, a debate around table on you know should you pay ransom should you not pay the ransom and mm. one of the one of the, the, the people participating in that I can't remember who it was but they were talking about you know the impact of the families of the people that you know work for that company and all the employees yeah. and stuff like that and it was actually an aspect that I hadn't really considered before you know if you if you're a you know a company that you, you've got employees um, yep. you're locked up you can't pay them you know if you go out of business then they're all impacted, obviously. So I thought that was a very interesting. Yeah, aspect. look, at the end of the day, it's, you know, you've got to look after the shareholders, obviously, if you publicly mm. trade it. But the first responsibility you've got is to is to the staff. Um, sure, customers and, and everything, but looking after the staff that have looked after you, that that's the number one. So, mm. um, and a lot of organisations will say, oh, well, we've got, um, you know, we use third-party uh, payroll systems. I, I won't mention any because so I might accidentally skip to the wrong part and think we're talking about that. <laughs> but um, but they, they they might look at that and it's like okay, but what are you doing to protect the data that sits within that? Um, what are you doing to to protect the login for those various systems? So there's all of these things that organisations need to consider. That it's not just the internal network. There's all of these external services as well that you need to. You need to make sure it's being protected. Um, Third-party risk management is huge. It's a big one, yep. Making sure that the third party, right? We were talking about uh, incident response retainers previously. Making sure that the, the third party that you're entrusting with all of your data and your payroll systems possibly, more than likely, has an, uh, has an incident response retainer in place. Because if they don't, but you do, it, it, what's the point? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. that's a really important thing, and I've worked with you know people in the GRC space where you know that that's a big part of what they do is those third party you know risk management side of things, and yeah, the sort of going through and making sure that if you're going to be doing business with a company that they have adequate controls in place to if you know as you're saying it's not you're not going to stop if, if people want to get in they'll get in, but the ability to at least pick that up and respond to it. Yeah, look, it, it's key. And then it's not only the, the incident response side of things, but it's asking them the question, if you were to suffer a breach or you had a critical uh, vulnerability that was identified, would you tell me? Mm. Would, would you actually let me know? Uh, and then it comes down to the fact, well, 
who's going to have the reputational damage? Is it going to be the third party? Well, no, it's going to be you because you're the one who has to put out the statement. You might have gotten caught up in a third party breach, but you still entrust a third party with your data. Yeah. Um, and there's there's plenty of third parties that uh, they keep getting compromised and supply chain risk just becomes even more real on an ongoing basis. Definitely. The third party supply chains definitely a it's a big one. No question about it. So so in summary, because I just realized we've been talking for over half an hour, <laughs> as as Cyber Years always starts have a fifteen to, to twenty minute discussion and I think the, the first one turned into over an hour and we don't want to make people listen to us uh, jabber on for, for over an hour. Basic summary, make sure you've got an instant response plan and that you test it because it's all well and good having. If you don't test it and you don't verify it, it you may as well not have it. Make sure you've got an instant response retainer uh, in place. And actually, I'm going to add something to that. Um, make sure that the organization you have an instant response retainer in place with will work 24-7 around the clock during an incident um, and that they will work weekends. Um, there have been some incidents we've been involved with, and I'm not naming names, um, where the IR team, the, the lead, has stopped at 5 o'clock on a Friday um, and they picked it's back up o'clock. on Monday. <laughs> beer o'clock, yeah, absolutely. So... Isn't that how you get through incident response, though? A couple of, couple of tinnies and off you go? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> fuel. Yeah, the fuel for the fire, fuel for the chase. Um, and also make sure an executive is assigned to, to incident management. Um, generally, the CEO or a COO is going to be able to talk to, to your organization, CEO or COO. Um, you don't want the, the lead technical incident responder who's been awake for 47 hours straight um, getting on the phone to, to the CEO. No, no offense, Rich, at all. Um, but, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's understandable that there have been times where it's sort of, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning, you're dealing with something and just rereading the same sentence you know, a couple of times. It's like, I really shouldn't be on the phone to stakeholders right now. But Yeah, I've got, I've got an incident briefing in four hours and I'm still trying to work out what my name is. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, when you're when you're looking at that instant response plan, response retainer with a, a reputable company that works 24/7 around the clock um, and does everything they can do to get you back online, can speak to the executive um, in a way that they're going to understand. You don't have to bring in another party to to be the incident manager. You definitely don't want that. Um, and generally, just oh, do red teaming. So um, uh, threat intelligence based red teaming, and generally have good cyber hygiene. And the only way you can have good cyber hygiene is to do intelligence-based red teaming, intelligence-based testing. Yep. Anything else that you'd recommend to anyone that's listening to this? Um, if, yeah, if, if, if you suspect that you've got a, a serious cybersecurity incident or even, you know, it might not be serious, just something's going on um, and you are going to be engaging someone to come and do it, whether that's internal or an external company, um, my recommendation is to try not to touch anything on that system. Mm. So don't shut it down. Um, one of the critical things that we will like to capture if we can is memory. And as soon mm. as you shut down a machine, then that's gone. Um, yep. And if try not to log into it and poke around, um, mm. especially with a domain <laughs> admin account, because if that machine <laughs> is compromised and the attackers are on it, they might, you know, they can pull the, the hashes for your domain admin account. Um, yep while you're on there and anything you do on there might modify some of the stuff that as forensic practitioners, we, we look for. Mm -hmm. So you, you could be mod modifying the registry or, yeah. you know, if creation times, file access times, things like that. Super important to maintain. Um, yep. And the, the last piece that I've got to, to add and you've jogged my memory there is contact your cyber insurer. If you have one immediately, um, if, there, if there's a suspected compromise, there's no point holding back and waiting. It's just keeping them informed. Um, we've done some incident response where the uh, the organisation has been paid fully because they notified the, uh, the insurer that, that while we were still on the initial incident call. We've had others that have gotten 43% because they waited until a couple of days after um, the, the initial compromise. So the insurers want to know immediately um, if, you're, if your incident response um, team that you have the retainer with aren't on the insurance panel, 
generally the, the insurer will replace them with someone that's on the panel and that's completely okay. Most of us are, are completely fine with, with handing the, the investigation over because we want to get you back online and, and we don't want to cost you money. Um, so get the insurer involved immediately. Don't wait. There's no point. Yep. I mean, something, you know, you, you might think it's just one machine. It's suspicious. And then it turns out that it's not just one. You know, once it's the instant response machine. people get in there and start digging, they might, you know, find that your whole, your whole network's been compromised. Yep, multiple signs of lateral movement. And as soon as we see signs of lateral movement, we know. Um, and there's specific things that we look for, but but we know it's game over, don't we? Yep. Well, mate, on that uh, on that very pleasant and cheery note. <laughs> uh, Ended on high. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we do that, though. As cyber professionals, we walk into a room and everyone's like, oh, the security guys are here. The roof must be on fire. Yep. Um, <laughs> the, roof's not, the roof's not always on fire. It's, it's often on fire. Uh, especially when level three uh, forensics and, and incident responders <laughs> are, are, are there, but uh, it's not always doom and gloom. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, until next time, thank you for tuning into to Cybeers. Uh, we're aiming to do more of these uh, on a more regular basis. So do keep an eye out, tune in. Hope you learned something. Uh, hope cyber is an important topic for you and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Bye.